So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, guys, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, as that was being read, it's not an easy chapter, like, let's put it this way. If you were just reading this chapter on its own, it'd be kind of difficult to understand what it's about, I think, just on its own. Um, you really need the context of 1 Corinthians to understand chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, okay? But let's look at uh, verse number 2, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2. It says, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So the title of the sermon this morning is The Riches of Their Liberality. Okay? Now, keep a finger there in 2 Corinthians and turn back to 1 Corinthians 16. Let's build some context before we read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16... Now, I hope you can sort of take your mind back to what we preached about in this chapter. But you may remember, you know, pretty much leading up to this cha final chapter, there was a lot of correction. There was a lot of things that the Corinthian church had to fix. And then we get to chapter 16, and things turn, and Paul is asking that the Corinthians would put a collection together, a donation together for the saints that were in Jerusalem, okay? For the saints that were in Judea, okay? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. And by the way, the next two chapters, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9, is about us giving of our finances. Okay? And it's not about giving of your tithes, but actually it's giving toward needy believers. Okay? These are special collections, special uh, offerings for other people, not so much about the running of the day-to-day -day church. But 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, the Bible reads, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Because remember, Paul had planned to come to this church and had not yet come. Verse number 3, And when I come... Whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality, that's your donation, your liberality, your donation, your giving unto Jerusalem. Okay? So they were doing a special collection amongst all the churches. Paul was going and visiting different churches, and they were getting a collection together, a donation together to those in Jerusalem. Okay? To those in Jerusalem. Now please turn to Acts 11. <coughs> Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Again, we're just building the context here. Why do they need to give to the saints in Jerusalem? Acts 11, verse 27. The Bible reads, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And remember, it was the Antioch church that sent out Paul. So Paul had heard from these prophets from Jerusalem. Verse 28, And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth, or that's like a great famine, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then all the, sorry, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. So it seems like Judea suffered the worst of this coming drought that was prophesied. Okay? And so it says there in verse 29, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, meaning of his finances, some have more than others, some had more to give than others, but of their ability they determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Verse 30, Which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And Saul is the name of Paul. Okay, uh, Saul, Paul is Saul. So you see that Paul continues this work that he's going around collecting uh, um, of the finances of, of, of each church's ability to give toward this future need of the brethren in Judea who would be suffering in this drought. Okay? So go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Because I think once you have this centered in your mind, you understand what this chapter is about, it, it makes a lot more sense. Okay? It makes a lot more sense. And you'll notice that there are certain words like liberality, or of the grace. Um, you know, we're used to these words meaning freedom and grace being something that's un, un, unmerited, undeserved. But really, these are words to, to basically talk about the donation that was being collected. Okay? 
So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. All right? So what grace of God is he referring to? We'll see in this chapter, he's actually talking about the donation that the churches in Macedonia were able to give to this effort. So it says, look, I'm able to witness of this grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. Okay? Um, so it's talking about the, 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 uh, the Macedonian church giving of their donations, giving of what they um, had. And what you'll notice in these first few verses, he's saying this to encourage the Corinthian church to give of themselves. Okay? Because what you'll notice later on is that, yes, Paul wrote about it in 1 Corinthians, that they need to give, but they had not yet done it. And so in 2 Corinthians, he's there reminding them, you've got to continue what you've left off. You started a collection, but you've not finished it off. Okay, so he's talking about now the churches of Macedonia. And again, if you remember, the reason why Paul was in Macedonia was because he was looking for his uh, brother Titus. Remember? And in Macedonia, he was getting a lot of persecution, a lot of problems within this city uh, for being Christians. Look at verse number two. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So he's saying, look, it's not just me that was suffering persecution in Macedonia, but it's these churches as well, that they've been suffering great trial of affliction. And yet even though <coughs> they're suffering great trial of affliction, it says that they had an abundance of joy. They were rejoicing in their tribulation. They were rejoicing in their affliction. And look, and their deep poverty. So these churches did not have too much of finances. They weren't really blessed financially as much as the Corinthian church was. Though the Corinthian church had a lot of problems, they were doing well financially. Okay? Whereas the churches in Macedonia, they had deep poverty. They were lacking for themselves. And yet they're able to rejoice even in, in, in trials and afflictions. And it says, And the deep poverty abounded unto the riches of the liberality. So he could see how much these churches were rejoicing by how much they were giving for this donation, for, for the needs of these brethren in Jerusalem. And what I find interesting about this is this seems to be a, a common uh, denominator no matter where you go. People that have less seem to be the more generous versus the people that have more, people that have in abundance, they're more likely to be very tight with what they have, very likely to be tight with their money, tight with their service for other people. But yet people that, have, that are without always seem to be a lot more generous. You know? I liken this to you know, when we were in Chile. I've been, I've been to Chile, South America for, I mean, I don't know how many times, maybe 15 times in my life. You know? we, we almost traveled every year when I was a child. And... Um, a lot of my family there live in farms. A lot of them don't have a lot of finances. They work on their farms. You know, they've got cattle or they've got, um, you know, they, they grow uh, 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 berries and things like that and then sell them off. But it's, what I always found was with my family, it was always those that had least that would look after you the best. It's, they would always be the ones that would bring you and, and offer you a meal. And it wasn't just a meal. They would bring a meal, you guys know, you've been there, and then when you're full and you're finished, they bring another meal. It's like, oh man, I'm full. And then when that's done, they bring you another meal. It's like, oh, I can't finish this, right? I can't eat this. And then you think it's finished, and then they bring dessert, you know? But it's always those that have the least, for whatever reason, you know, money drives us to be very tight, money drives us to be very selfish. And, you know, if you're, if you're not, you know, like completely rich, if you're not like a millionaire, praise God, because you might be a much more terrible person if that was the case, okay? But those that, that, uh, that lack are always more willing to give of themselves. And this is just a principle that we saw here with the Macedonian church. Not only were they poor, they were being afflicted, um, but yet they were able to give of their riches, okay? Now, let's look at verse number three. For to their power or to their ability, I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So beyond of what they could give, they gave even more. They, these, poor, these poor people in Macedonia. Okay? And, and Paul is saying, look, I bear record of this. 
You know, they saw the need in, in Judea. They have a love for the brethren. Yes, they gave of, the, of what they can, but they gave even more than that. Okay? Beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. You know, to give of themselves out of love and generosity. Verse number four. Now, it's interesting, verse number four, because it seems like Paul, knowing their state, knowing their affliction and knowing their poverty, he pushes back a little bit. You know, has anyone ever offered you something and you're like, oh, you know, you don't need to do that. You know, there's, there's no need for that. Well, that's kind of what we see in verse number four. He's, he says, this, these churches praying us or asking of us <coughs> with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. So these churches are like, no, Paul, we want to give of this. You know, Paul's probably saying, hey, no, it's too much. You know, you guys need to look after yourselves. You know, just, just give of what you can. You don't need to give more than what you can. And he's saying, look, they're praying us. They're asking us with much entreaty. Paul, no, please take this. Please take of what we have uh, that we would receive the gift. Because it sounds like he was kind of resisting the gift, right? And take upon us, it says there in verse 4, take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. So this was a way the Macedonian churches were ministering to the saints in Judea by giving of themselves financially because they know their brethren were going to suffer in the droughts. And it says the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. Okay, The fellowship. Now when we think of fellowship, we think of a physical interaction, right? We think of spending time together, conversing together, praying together, but giving to another church, giving to a needful ministry is a way of demonstrating fellowship to those brethren, okay? Uh, so it reminds me of Acts 20, 35. You don't need to turn there, but the Bible says, speaking of Jesus Christ saying how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I have found that in my life, that is so true. In the flesh, we want to receive, right? In the flesh, we want to make sure we have an abundance and not to give. Yet when you give of yourself, you know, it doesn't always have to be financially. It can be, you know, offering a meal to somebody or giving of your time, giving of, of you know, uh, of yourself to another believer. It's, ble it's, it's a blessing. You know, you find great joy when you give to other people, you know. And let me just encourage you, when you give to somebody, don't have an expectation that they need to return that favor. Okay, because it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I think it, 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 uh, it um, feeds the spirit, it feeds the new man when you can give of yourself and give of your finances to other brethren that need your help. Okay, verse number five. Verse number five. And this they did not as we hoped, meaning that because they had given more than what Paul thought was right, so th this they did not as we hoped, because their hope was that they would give less, right? But first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So we need to notice that. Why was this church able to be so generous in their giving, even in their poverty? It says because they first gave of their own selves to the Lord. And if you find yourself as someone who is not generous, if you find yourself... You know, you don't want to give liberally of, of, your, of your finances to the church or to other ministries, then potentially you've not yet given of your own self to the Lord. That's step number one, to give of yourself, to give your time to the Lord. Spend time in fellowship with the Lord God because when you're fellowshipping, fellowshipping with God, you're going to be filled with His light, you're going to be filled with His love, you're going to be filled with His generosity. And as a natural outpouring of that, you're going to be able to give of yourselves to minister to the saints, okay? If you find yourself just not wanting to, to uh, encourage your fellow believers, then you need, you're probably missing this first part. You've not given enough of yourself to the Lord. You've not necessarily given your, maybe yourself enough to Bible reading, to a quiet time with the Lord where you spend time with the Lord, praying with Him, okay? Reading the Bible, singing praises to God just for your own self. Okay, coming to church twice a week is not enough. That's only twice a week. You know, you need to spend every day with the Lord. And what you'll find is the more you fellowship with the Lord, the more closely you abide with Him, the greater you become as far as your generosity, your giving. Your, 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 your nature will change uh, toward your fellow brethren. Okay? Um, 
Verse number six. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. So that same grace is the finances. Okay? So remember, Titus went to see this church. You know, he came back with a good report. They, they're doing really well, Paul. They've really implemented a lot of these things. But the one thing that I had dropped was I hadn't yet collected the, the donation to the brethren in Judea. And so he's saying, look, Titus began this when he went down to see you, but we also need to finish this. We need to finish this, this same grace, okay? Because again, what's grace? Undeserved merit, right? It's something that's free, that's undeserving. So in a way, these, these believers in Judea in a way, undeserving of these finances that were being collected by the churches. And that's why it's called the, the grace that's been given by, by this church. Okay? So they had to finish what they had begun. Okay? So yeah, it looks like they took it on board, 1 Corinthians 16. Looks like Titus uh, was involved in helping this collection get started, but had not finished what he had begun. And there might be many reads. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm willing to give the Corinthian church the benefit of the doubt. You know, because we see that they had a lot of things to fix. They had a lot of false doctrines. They had to kick someone out of the church. They had to uh, have a, a selfish, uh, sorry, work, um, work off their selfishness and, and give of themselves to other believers in the church. They had a lot of things to improve. So it might be, this being the, sort of the final chapter in chapter 16, the last task that Paul had given them to do, they just didn't get around to do it. They just didn't get around to finishing it. That's a possibility. I like to give them the benefit of the doubt. It's not like they intentionally tried to avoid this uh, to give of themselves. They might have just forgotten. They had some, maybe this was just a lower priority thing for them. They had so many other things to fix in their church. Um, verse number seven. Therefore, as ye are bound in everything, so now he's referring to the Corinthian church. He spoke of the Macedonian church, how they had given of themselves more than what you know, he thought was right. And then verse number seven, therefore as ye are bound in everything. So he says, look, Corinthian church, you're abounding. Okay? The Macedonians, they're suffering. They're in poverty. But you're abounding in everything. He's talking about their improvement once again. He says they're abounding in faith. You know, their trust in God has increased. The faith of the church as a whole has increased. And utterance. You know, I believe the word utterance there is the preaching of the gospel. Okay? Like Ephesians 6.19 says, As for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. So I, I believe this is the utterance here that they're abounding in, is that this church has got back out there doing the soul winning, got back out there preaching the gospel. What else did they abound in? And knowledge. Okay, so they're a wiser church now than they were before. <coughs> Remember, Paul calls them a carnal church. But now, he says, you're abandoning knowledge. You're much smarter, you're much wiser now than you were before. And then he says, and in all diligence. What's diligence? They're putting an effort in, right? They're not slacking off. They're working hard as a church now. They're working hard to improve. And then what else have they abandoned in? And in your love to us. So they've increased in love to Paul and to the other leaders that Paul was sending into the church. But then it ends with this. So you're abounding in all these things, Corinthian church. See that you are bound in this grace also. See that you are bound in your giving to the needs of the brethren in, in Judea. Okay? Because that's, that's the last bit that you've, you've left off. That's the last bit that you need to work on. Okay? Again, the context is this is not about their regular giving of tithes. Okay, again, just keep that in mind because in chapter 9, there are verses there that people apply to the, to the doctrine of tithing. But this is not even about tithing. This is just about a, a collection for um, saints that were needful, ne needy. Okay? Verse number 8. Verse number 8. Now, Paul is laid, laid it on pretty thick, right, to the Corinthian church. I mean, if I was in the Corinthian church, I'd be thinking, man, we better do this donation. We better finish this off, right, and send it to Titus. Um, but verse number eight, he says this, I speak not by commandment, okay? So this is not some mandatory thing you need to do. This is not a command of God. If you, want to, if you just rather not give, 
That's fine. I mean, if you rather not give, that's, that's okay. This is not a commandment, okay? This is but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. So Paul goes, look, this is, a, this is not a command, but this is a way that you can prove that you love the brethren. <laughs> I don't know, if I was this church, I'd be like, it's not a command, but it feels like a command. <laughs> you know? Otherwise, if we don't give, it's going to seem like we're not a loving church. And that's, that's the truth of it, basically. You know, I've said this before, you know, uh, look, thanks for the giving that you guys do, by the way. The offering, it's always sufficient, and we'll see soon why it's always sufficient. Um, but, you know, if there's ever brethren in need, if there's ever, if we ever need to take, on, take up a special uh, offering for a, a, a reason for other brethren, that is a way for us to demonstrate our love toward them, okay? Now, I'm not going to give to people that are lazy, you know, I'm not going to give to people that are suffering because of their own laziness, the lack of work or whatever. No. Okay? But obviously when we see the need here, there was this great drought. I mean, this is stuff, something that was outside of the control of the brethren in Judea. And so, hey, you know, if there's brethren in need, in, 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 um, need outside of their control, then yeah, I'm more than happy to take on a special collection and give to another church or to other brethren uh, that need it. Okay? Uh, it's a demonstration of our love. Verse number nine, verse number nine. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say this. It's kind of like, uh, verse number nine, that's the memory verse, right? Um, it kind of just appears out of nowhere here. But like, I can imagine certain people in the Corinthian church going, ah, oh, do we really need to give? You know, I mean, you know, we've got our own problems. You know, we're fixing our own issues. Do we really need to give to others? And I love how he just drops in verse number nine here. He goes, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So he's saying, look, just, just in case you don't want to give of yourself, don't you remember how Jesus Christ was rich? He was glorious in heaven. He had all the riches in heaven. And yet he made himself poor. He became a man, you know, to make you rich. You know, Jesus Christ did not have great possessions on this earth. He didn't even have a house. He had no place to rest his head. He was going from city to city, preaching the gospel. For a, for a moment in time, God himself makes himself poor for others, right? And of course, you can't deny that, right? As, as a church, you know, you're thinking, oh, should I really give? Oh, by the way, Jesus gave to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I must feel like he's guilt tripping the Corinthian church to, to give of themselves because Jesus Christ has given so much more of himself. <coughs> and it wasn't just his life. It wasn't just his teaching. It wasn't just his suffering that he gave. But when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are in Christ and everything that Jesus Christ inherits from God the Father, you inherit as well. So it's not just the riches of salvation, of knowing God, of having the new man, of having the blessings of God upon you on this earth, but for all eternity, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Inherit everything that he has inherited by the Father. So it's kind of like in comparison, come on, you can give of yourself, right? You can, come on church, you can finish this donation and give to the Corinthian church. Uh, can you guys turn to Philippians chapter 2? Keep a finger there in 2 Corinthians 8. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4. And by the way, if you ever find yourself unmotivated to serve God, the best thing to do is just to bring to remembrance what Jesus Christ has done for you. If you feel unmotivated to go and preach the gospel, just remember, hold on, Jesus Christ preached the gospel. Jesus Christ is the reason I'm saved and obviously, when you, when you think of Jesus Christ and you think of what he's done for you, that's going to drive your motivation to do the works, to serve him. But in Philippians 2 verse 4, this goes well together. The Bible says, Look not every man on his own things. Now, obviously, we all do look on our own things. We all do look and make sure that you know, we have enough for ourselves and enough for our families. Nothing wrong with that, Right? But the rest of verse 4 says, but every man also, so also means not just on your own things, but also on the things of others. So I think this goes really well with 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 
because this church needed not just to look upon, uh, for their own things, but also for the th uh, things of others, that being the church in Jerusalem. Verse number five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, okay? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. The God of the universe, who's full of reputation, makes himself of no reputation when he comes to be a man. Okay? Um, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <coughs> so we see the Son of God, Jesus Christ, full of glory, okay, full of power, full of riches. He humbles himself. He takes on the form of a servant. He becomes a man becomes a servant. I mean, think it just, you know, that's why great is the mystery of godliness. How can God do this? You know, it's amazing. But this is the mind of Christ Jesus. He's looking out for the needs of others, you know. And again, if, if you find yourself pretty selfish, un, you know, not wanting to give of yourself or giving of your finances to people in need, then you need to have the mind of Christ. You need to be uh, fellowshipping with the Lord God more often so that he can work in you and he can change your mind, he can renew your mind to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So you would think with that, knowing that, that, that that's now going to cause the church to want to give. Oh yeah, you know, Jesus Christ has given so much of himself. Verse number 10. And herein I give my advice. So he's saying like it's not a commandment, this is my advice. Like... Um, for this is expedient for you, this is profitable for you, who have, be, <coughs> who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. So this verse gives us confirmation that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is at least a year apart, right? Because it's saying, look, it, it started a year ago. You started to give a year ago, but you need to finish this. You need to, uh, this work that you began, you need to finish it. Verse 11. Now therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. So the church was willing. You know, Paul recognizes you've got a, you, you're willing to give, but you need to make sure that you carry out a performance. You know, it, it's good to will to do something, but it's only profitable once you do it. You know, and the Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We understand that, that principle, but still, what's the point of willing something and not trying to carry out and doing it? You know, I've, I've said this before, you know, when we're talking about repentance, you know, someone's willing to turn from the sins or whatever. You know, it's, it's like me saying, I'm willing to go to work, but I just don't go to work. You know, do I get credit just, just, to be, just because I'm willing to go to work? No. You know, it's profitable once you, you perform that will. Once you, do, you go about and you do that will, okay? then it's profitable. And that's what Paul is saying. Yes, look, you have a willing to do it. That's a good thing. But make sure you carry out that will. Okay? And let me just liken that to... Well, actually, before... Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, I, I liken that to say, to say, so, say soul winning. A lot of believers are willing to go soul winning. Okay? They're willing to do it. And they say to me, Kevin, I want to get out there and knock doors. All right, let's set a time. Oh, I can't make it. All right, next week. Oh, no, I don't think I can. It's like, well, when? Like, it, it, okay, it's, it's one thing to will, but you've got to carry that out, okay? And so think about all the things that you're willing to do for the Lord. You know, maybe it's soul winning. Maybe you're willing to finish your Bible, read it from cover to cover. Okay, you're willing to do it, but do it. Finish it, right? 15 minutes a day and you'll get through it in a whole year, finishing the Bible. I don't know. Think about, you know, yourself. Things that you're willing to do for God, but you've not yet done Hey, it's time to perform it. It's time to, you know, it's good that you're willing, but it's time to do something about it, right? 
Verse number 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Okay? Um, so a willing mind ought to be based on what you have, what you can do. <sighs> uh, um, can you get me a serviette, Isabel? Um, so, yeah, so a willing mind is, is uh, based on what you can give. If I said to you, brother, I'm willing to give you a million dollars, but I don't have a million dollars. So, you know, you need to be able to give of what you have, okay? You know, if you say, I'm willing to go soul winning, you've got two legs, you've got a mouth, you've got the Bible, that's something you can do, okay? But don't, don't promise, don't, make, don't be willing to do things, you know, that you're not able to do. Thanks, Isabel. Otherwise, and I've met a lot of Christians like this, they become a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. That's what we read about in 1 Corinthians, right? A lot of noise. You know, ah, oh, I want to I wanna do this missionary trip or, you know, I, I want to you know, preach the gospel every day of my life or I want to do this and I want to do that. But they never get around to doing it. You know, I want to read the Bible cover to cover. I want to do this. You know, just, just do it. Stop talking and make sure when you're willing to do something, it's something that you're able to achieve and then do it. And then put into place the next greater thing that you can do. Okay? One thing at a time. Start with the smaller things. And I, I preached this a little bit on, on Friday and I gave the example of, of new believers that finish high school and they're like, man, I want to serve the Lord. I want to get into Bible college. I want to get into full-time ministry. But yeah, you know, Bible college is not a God-ordained institution. But the workplace is. The business is a God-ordained institution. Okay? Do that. Do what God has asked you to do first and then think about going one step at a time, you know, and getting into full-time ministry. But just be willing to do what you're able to do, not what you're not able to do. Verse 13. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened. He goes, look, it's not about favoritism. I'm not trying to make the Judean Christians uh, eased, right, to get this, this huge uh, donation and they can live easy and now you're living in, in, you know, you're burdened because you don't have enough. That's not the goal. It's not about favoritism. It's not take, about taking all the wealth of the Corinthians to make the Judean, Judean Christians wealthy and, and, and easygoing. But verse 14, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. Okay? So you now, Corinthian church, you have an abundance of riches. You, you're, you're doing well financially. Now's the time for you to give to these, to, to, to these believers. And then it says that their abundance also may be a supply for your wants, that there may be equality. So there might come a time where you need financial help. You have a need. And then these guys will be in abundance and they can help you. Okay? So it's not about favoritism. It's not about having this church favor over that one. It's about equality. We're all the same in Jesus Christ. And if we can give of ourselves to a needy believer, we should do so. Okay? The Christians in Judea were struggling because of drought, because of a lack of rain. And again, this isn't about just lazy believers. Let's just give to a lazy believer, right? Let's say, let's say there's a believer that's saved, that's our brethren, but they don't work. They don't even, even, they don't look for work, they don't work, and they're like, brethren, I need help. I've got bills to pay. I'm not going to give to that, right? That's not, that's not what it's about. Okay, if, you're, if you have control, then you need to look after your own needs. But if something's outside of your control and you're struggling, that's the time to give, okay? That's the time to give. Verse 15. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Does anybody know where that is written? Anybody want to take a guess? Exodus. Uh, Psalms as well, I think, maybe. It's when, uh, uh, it's when God rained manna from heaven. Remember that? Remember when God rained manna in heaven to the Israelites because they were hungry? Um, go to Exodus. So keep a finger there in 2 Corinthians 8. Go to Exodus 16. Exodus 16. Let's look at it. Exodus 16, verse 16. 
Exodus 16, verse 16. So ultimately, the teaching here, guys, is this. Give what you can, because ultimately, it is the Lord who provides. Okay? Give what you can. Ultimately, it's the Lord that provides. And when He provides, when God provides, it's always the perfect amount. It always matches up with the need. Always. Okay? Look at verse uh, uh, 16, Exodus 16, 16. Uh, back in the, in the days when they were in the wilderness, Israelites, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, gather of it, so that the manna that was rained from heaven, gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man. So the omer, I don't know how, what that weight is, but it's, it's a weight. So every man is to take an omer for, him, for themselves. According to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And so let's say my family, you know, we're a family of uh, 11 right now. So we would then take, if we were in these days, we would take 11 omers for the family. Okay? Um, and then uh, verse 17. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. It just shows you their disobedience, right? God says, look, one omer for each person. And yet when they gathered it, some took more and some took less. It's just the nature of man. For some reason, they like to disobey the Lord. Um, but then look at this in verse number 18. And when they did meet, or when they measured it with an omer, so that's, that's a weight, when they, when they measured it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. So somehow, miraculously, if you gathered more than you needed, when you weighed it, it still weighed an omer. And if you gathered less than you needed and you weighed it, it, it was an omer. Okay, this, this was a miracle that took place. And you might say, well, what's the, what's the teaching here? Is that when God provides, it's always enough. Okay, some churches might be able to give little. Okay, some churches are able to give a lot. But ultimately, when those donations reach the needy believers, it's going to be sufficient. God's going to take care that the amount that gets given is sufficient. There won't be anything left over and it will never be not enough. Okay? And I'm keeping this in mind. It's good that I'm, I'm going through this chapter because we're soon going to be hiring a building. We're soon going to be paying twice as much to have our church services. And I'm hoping that, you know, I'm, I'm taking this at face value, you know, to the Lord and saying, well, the Lord will make sure, you know, it's provided for. The Lord will make sure the sufficient income, uh, sorry, uh, offering and tithes coming in to make sure that, you know, every month, we can pay what we need to pay. That's my hope. That's my belief in uh, going through this chapter, right? But the other thing I want you to understand is that the manna that came down from heaven was a type, was a picture of the, the, the sacrificial body of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? When Jesus Christ says that the Israelites ate of the manna, he's saying, but you need to eat of my flesh, of my body, okay? So the manna represented the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know the Lord Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross of Calvary. <coughs> the point is this. His sacrifice was enough. Okay? You might be someone that has a terrible past. You might be someone that has great sins in their life. Or you might be someone that doesn't have like a terrible past, doesn't really have any great sins, but you've got your own sins, you know, of itself. It doesn't matter how messed up your life is. It doesn't matter how sinful your life was. When Christ died on that cro cross, it was enough. It was sufficient. There was nothing left over. It was all paid for. There wasn't, he didn't die for more than he needed either. Okay? It's all been purchased by Jesus Christ. He even died for the sins of the unbelievers. Okay? He died for every sin, but the reason they don't get saved, obviously, is because they don't believe on Jesus Christ. Okay? So you've got to remember that this picture of giving also points to the sacrifice of Christ, which is why, again, Paul goes back saying, hey, you know, Christ has given a lot of himself, you know. He, he had given of himself, so we need to have that mind of Christ. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And by the way, if Christ has paid for all our sins, if his sacrifice was sufficient, there's nothing that you can add to it. Okay, there's nothing more that you need to do except place your full faith and trust on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 16. 
2 Corinthians 8.16 But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into your heart of Titus for you. Um, so obviously Titus, having been refreshed going to the Corinthian church, uh, had a great love for these people. Okay? Um, he was refreshed by their improvement, refreshed by their zeal. And he's saying, look, I'm sending Titus your way to finish this collection because he has a great love for you. And I know that you have a great love for Titus. Verse 17, For indeed he accepted the exhortation, <coughs> but being more forward, of his own accord he went unto you. So he's saying, look, yeah, I, I told Titus to go back, but he says, look, out of his own accord he went unto you. He wants to go back to the Corinthian church. He's encouraged by what was developing. He was encouraged by the improvement. It's not like Paul had to twist Titus' arm. Titus, by his own accord, uh, has gone unto them to, to finish that collection. Verse 18. And then he says this, And we have sent with him the brother. Now the brother is not named, but Titus is not going alone. He's going with someone else whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. So Paul says, look, there's a brother going with Titus, not named, but he has praise amongst all the churches that he's been to. He has a good reputation, okay? And he's going to be helping uh, Titus with this collection, okay? But he's got a good reputation throughout all the churches. He's got a good report amongst all the churches. Verse 19, And not that only, <clears throat> but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace. So the churches have entrusted this brother to travel with their grace, meaning their donation, their financial giving, right? They trusted this man with the finances. They weren't afraid that he was going to run off and spend the money for himself, okay? He was a trustworthy brother. But it seems like this, this brother had not yet met the Corinthian church. So that might be re the reason why Paul is kind of um, speaking highly of him, okay? Uh, ministered, uh, travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Um, verse number 20. Avoiding this... So what is Paul trying to avoid? That no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. So Paul is trying to avoid the potential blame of, ha of, of having others deal with the finances. Like instead of Paul being the one that does all the collection... He's got other men with good reputation sent by other churches going around doing the collection for the saints, okay? So, you know, Paul obviously wants to be open and honest. We see that in verse number 21. Proving for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord knows we're being honest. The Lord knows we're collecting and we're not, you know, spending the money for ourselves. But also in the sight of men, okay? So Paul understands the importance of being open and honest about the finances, okay? And that's why, as a church, you know, I, I always make an e effort every few months to give you guys an update of the finances. You know, if there's ever a large expense, then I'll tell you about it. You know, when it comes to this new building, I'm telling you up front what the costs are. You know, when I tell you how much is left to, that I need to be reimbursed for, you know, I'm, I'm open with the amount that you guys, you know, if you guys have any questions about the finances, feel free to ask me. You know, feel free to ask me. It's important for a church to be open and honest about the finances, okay? That's the lesson that we see here. Verse 22, And we have sent with them our brother, so I, think, I believe it's the same brother he referred to, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent. So this man was a very diligent, very uh, 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 responsible with finances. Maybe he had, he had a job like an accountant or something, I don't know. You know, but, you know, he was good with money. He was very diligent with money. Um, <coughs> and then it says, Upon the great confidence which I have in you. So I have great confidence that you're going to give, you know, liberally of yourselves to this need in Judea. And this brother is very diligent. He's going to make sure he takes care of it and sends it to the saints in Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, verse 23. Now notice this. this is, when I said to you, I'm happy for you guys to ask me any questions about the finances. I, I've got everything down on spreadsheets. If you want to check it out, I can send it to you. Whatever it is that you want. Because look at verse 23. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches 
and the glory of Christ. So Paul said, look, if you've got questions, if you've got inquiries about the finances, ask Titus. Titus knows everything about it. Okay? And so that, that's, again, please ask me if you have any questions about our finances, our church offering. I'm more than happy to give you that information because that's the way we ought to be, right? That's the way we ought to be. Verse 24. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. So again, just Paul, you know, laying, laying, laying it on there, you know, to the Corinthian church. Hey, you know, give before the churches, prove your love to the brethren, and he says, and of our boasting on your behalf. Paul says, I've been boasting about you. I've been talking well of your church, how you've improved, how you're doing so much better, how you love, you know, the apostles and, you know, you, you're, you're going out, you're doing the works now, you're kicking out the, the ungodly sinners out of your church, and I, I'm boasting of you, and I've also boasted that you're going to give of yourselves. <laughs> so make sure that you do, so it proves, you know, the, your love, and it also proves that my boasting was right about you. Man, it, it, I think it'd be hard to have a Paul around here, right? If we had Paul today... You know, it, it laid on pretty thick for us, I think. So um, that's what we see in this chapter. The next chapter is also about giving. But I just want you to understand that this is a special offering. Okay, you, you can't, yes, you can apply certain principles out of this, like I have, you know, being open and honest about finances. But it's not about your day-to-day -day giving, uh, sorry, your, your week-to-week -week giving and your tithes and, and offerings that you give. That's not what this is about. This is about a special need, a special offering and I don't know, I mean, uh, there might come a time where we need to do a special offering. I, I don't know, for, for a person in need. And I hope, now that we've gone through this, you understand why it's important to do that. You know, why you don't turn around and say, well, if there's a brother in need, can't we just give of the offering that we already, we already gave? No, sometimes there's a need for a special offering, okay? Giving above and beyond uh, what you normally give. All right, let's pray.